She wore, daringly, a brilliant red dress. <laughs> Slim, high to the chin, her face floated like a beautiful exotic bird above it. Her smile was the same. She changed the subject swiftly, the vagaries of age, of royalty, or both. I envy you, your teenage son, she said. I always thought you could have been our daughter. I wish I had been, I murmured, throwing my whole heritage to the wind recklessly. <laughs> ah, well, she said, we're friends, good friends. She held out her hand. I only just refrained from kissing it. And now you must go, Martha, dear. I grow tired. We'll meet again at the theater. And so, here we were, waiting for the curtain in the flower garden she had created from a single rose. I crossed my legs. The rhinestone tea straps showed on my feet. What beautiful shoes, Lynn exclaimed. Yes, I agreed. Comf comfortable now that I was no longer standing in them. Mm -hmm. Remember when you used to give me your old ones? Nonsense. I would never do such a thing. So vulgar. Why? <laughs> Why would I do that? Well, I couldn't afford expensive shoes. You see, I was a poor young actress. I only got equity minimum. What was that? <laughs> in those days, about $60, I replied. Oh, well then, perhaps I did give you my shoes. I was being kind. Did they fit? Oh, yes. We wear the same size. Big feet, she murmured. <laughs> size 8, I agreed. What are you two girls giggling about, demanded Morgan Library. <laughs> Women talk, said Lynn. In the small silence that followed, Dorothy Stickney leaned forward to speak to me. She was lovely. She still had the delicate grace, the wide-set eyes, the curving cheeks of Vinny in Life with Father. I'm halfway through your theatrical family saga, The Savage Brood, she said. I love it. I thanked her. Lynn said, I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, though it's dedicated to us. Such an honor. <coughs> But I've been so busy. I've been in such a whirl. I couldn't get to sleep last night until 3 o'clock. I was grateful they let me sleep till 11. That was nice. You got eight hours, said my husband. You're very sympathetic, Lynn said, reaching across me to pat his hand. The orchestra struck up, the curtain rose, a magnificent performance, a kind of glorious Channing Circus. We did not leave at the interval, remaining in our seats, stared out. She'll do it at the curtain, said Dorothy Stickney. She'll introduce you then. Oh, I hope not. No one will remember me, protested Lynn. Oh, of course they will, said my husband. After the curtain call, Carol Channing stepped forward, smiling. I half expected her to go into, well, hello, Lenny. <laughs> but she did not. She gave a charming little speech, explaining the occasion, and gesturing toward Lynn. You asked me to call you Linny, so I shall, Linny dear. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Lynn Fontan. Thunder broke loose. Thousands of clapping hands. After a long moment, Lynn rose without any help from me or even from the arms of her chair and stood tall as tall and bowed graciously. The applause grew deeper. She turned then slowly, and facing the rear, bowed to the balcony. Pandemonium! The house went wild, stamping feet, cries of bravo for a full five minutes. Lynn bravely and graciously bowing. You see, they did remember, I whispered, as Lynn sank finally to her seat. It was for Alfred, too, she said, wiping her eyes. Stay in your seat, said Morgan Library. They want the audience to clear out before they take Lynn backstage. We were then ushered outside and to the stage door. 
Lynn leaning now very heavily on my arm. Dorothy Stickney, far younger and sprier, <coughs> followed with our two personable escorts. It was only a step to the stage entrance, but the balmy May Day had given way to a punishing chill rain, and with our slow progress, we were drenched and shivering as we emerged onto the boards of the stage. Miss Fontaine, though, now feeling the familiar terrain under her feet, let go of my arm and stepped forward, bowing to the stage manager, smiling and addressing him by name. We passed him by as a tremendous burst of applause greeted us from the cast assembled on the stage, glowing, worshipful, making their palms ache. Lynn embraced the star, uttering words of extravagant praise, introducing her guests, beginning with Dorothy, who you know, of course, and getting my married name right for once. Martha auditioned for me when she was young, and now Martha is a famous author. Miss Fontaine thanked the cast for a lovely performance, singling them out. One young woman who played a plump, demi-mondaine, obviously padded and very pretty, Lynn addressed in special tones, taking her hand. My dear, you must be the most ravishing fat lady who ever graced the stage. <laughs> the young woman glowed and said, I'll live on that for years. We made our farewells, Lynn nodding and smiling to all the stagehands, followed once more by applause. We parted on the wet sidewalk. Majesty had had a long day. She kissed me goodbye. I stood huddled in my scanty stole against the wind and the rain, watching the limousine, a long black pumpkin, pull away like Cinderella. Except I had my prince. On Saturday afternoon, I called the Stickney house. Dorothy answered. Where have you been, she cried once more. We've been sending telegrams again. I was in the country, explaining that we went there every weekend. Oh, yes, said Dorothy. I do, too, usually. I thought I ought to call, I said. I wasn't sure when Miss Fontaine would be going back to Genesee Depot. Oh, yes, she cried. We're packing. Her plane leaves tonight. Oh, here's Lynn, and thank you so much. The wonderful voice of my memories came on then, and we talked a little. <coughs> soft amenities. I so liked your husband, dear, she said. I'm so glad you found someone so so lovely. And I'm so pleased with you, Martha. So pleased with the way you've turned out. <laughs> we spoke of the evening, and I thanked her for it. Oh, yes. It was quite the most wonderful evening in the theater. An evening to remember, she said. For me, it was too. And the premonitory tears filled my eyes. <laughs>